through the shoulder that my door and I'm like, uh, you must be at the wrong house. I, sh I sure wasn't uh, joining the military. That's not what I was expecting. So he said, well, just come on with me and, uh, you know, see if you can pass the test. I'm like, no way, I'm not joining the military. So he said, come on, just, just try it. So I went down there, I took the test. Yeah, I passed. And then I uh, took the physical and I passed. And I said, well, I'm not joining. So I left. Was back home, searching for a job, um, only had a high school diploma, didn't have any college, and didn't want to wait tables or just work at JCPenney. So I said, well, all right, I'll try it. So I called him back and I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join. But I'll, I'll join the National Guard because I don't want to go away. I don't think I can handle it. So I um, went to... Uh, basic training for Jackson, South Carolina. <laughs> At the time, I lived with the Oregon Army National Guard. And uh, I mean, I lived in Oregon, and I joined the Oregon Army National Guard because my father lived out there. And um, so basic training, AIT, came back. It was okay, you know, the military, it was, it was all right. It paid the bills. Um, for me, you know, being a single parent, uh, trying to raise a, a little baby. Um, my mother took care of my child while I was in basic training. So my mother was in New York, my child was already in New York, and I lived in Portland, Oregon. And, um, but it was okay. I paid the bills and, you know, started making me feel good about, you know, growing up and um, growing up trying to raise a child. Uh, I joined the National Guard, went on AGR. AGR is an active duty for the National Guard. I got back and I uh, was at duty and with the National Guard. I got to come home every day, take care of my baby, come home every day. And it's like a regular job. Um, went through that for several years. I said, you know, I, I think I'm going to become an officer. But I was told by my commander at the time that I wasn't officer material. And that I probably, you know, should consider uh, becoming an officer. So, I said, okay, but stubborn as I was, I, I didn't listen to him and um, joined another unit and got the, that commander to sign up on the paper so that I could become an officer. Um, however, you needed uh, some college credits. So because of my military background, um, some of my uh, experience allowed me to get college credits. So I got just enough to join, uh, become an officer. However, I didn't have enough to maintain it if I wanted to. So, but I had enough to join. So I joined OCS, and um, that was located at Camp Smith, Camp Smith, New York, in Peekskill. Um, went to OCS. It was hard. Um, when I went through the training. Very nervous. It was hard for me. It was the only female in my class, um, so it made it very hard to compete with all the guys who were very into being in the military, being in the military background, uh, knew all the uh, ins and outs of you know being a soldier, and um, of course being a female was really hard for me. Um, but I stuck with it. I stayed in it. You know going to make it my career, and at some point I got to the you know, decision that this was going to be a lifelong adventure for me. So anyway, I, um, I got through it, I graduated, and um, you know, that's why I'm here today. It's still, it's been 23 years I've been in the military. I know I look young, <laughs> but I'm really not. I've been in for 23 years and um, uh, I have seven more to go but I want to retire with a pension because um, when you're AGR, you're like active duty and you can retire in 20 years but most of that, when I went from an enlisted soldier to an officer, I got out of the military for like nine years or got off active duty for nine years and became a corrections officer. So I've been in uniform all my life. <laughs> Well, um, worked at the state in Lakeland 
work in the Latham Army at the headquarters. It's like the headquarters for the whole New York Army National Guard in the state, uh, in this state. And um, while I was there, um, when I went on ahead, I was, uh, my job was mobilization. So I had to cut orders. Uh, another one of my jobs was drug testing, testing all the soldiers before they deployed. And probably one of the worst jobs I had was I was responsible for notifying the families uh, that the loved one was killed. So that was um, one, of my, one of the hardest jobs um, that I had to do while I was in the world. Um, and then um, next thing you know, I said, well, I want to do something else in my career. I didn't want to keep notifying families and keep mobilizing soldiers. So I said, I'm going to be an executive officer. But when you're, uh, um, when, you're uh, um, when you're in the military, for your career to progress, there's certain jobs that you have to take on. And to become a commander, I need to be an executive officer. So I applied to become an executive officer for a personnel service at the time. And when I applied, I got notified, um, and the day I got notified, they told me that I was being deployed. So it was like a bittersweet um, notification. Yes, you got the job, great, but you're being deployed. Well, of course, I've you know, never been deployed before, and knowing it was known, it was going to be good for my career. I was like, you know, I can do this, I can do this. I can go to Iraq and serve my country and do what I have to do. So, uh, of course, uh, as the XO, responsible for making sure everything was uh, uh, organized together, uh, we deployed to Fort Trump first, went through our training, and then off to Iraq and then we stationed. I was stationed in Milan. We got split up. I was stationed in Milan. The other half of the battalion was stationed in Baghdad. Our our, our uh, mission was to uh, was to operate a joint military mail terminal for all of Iraq. So all the mail that flew in, we were responsible for giving out to the troops. Um, we didn't think it was a, um, as an important mission. We said, oh, we got postal? Okay. But we got there, we found out how important postal mail was. The soldiers lived for their packages. I mean, the packages and letters from the loved one was one of the most important things that got us through um, being away. So um, we found out that our mission was um, my duty was to uh, uh, stand up in Iraq. In Iraq, there was two joint military mail terminals. One was in Kuwait, and the other one was uh, in Baghdad. Well, they wanted to send me again forward to Balad to set up a new group. So I went to Balad and convoy from Baghdad to the line. Not thinking that it was, you know, not really feeling all the danger that we were in. The convoy uh, of vehicles was not up armored. Um, some of the soldiers sat right in the back of the uh, vehicle. And a lot of them went convoy. And uh, we got there safely. No incidents. Nobody shooting on us. Shooting on us. That was great. But had hindsight, had we known um, how dangerous it is today, we would have not gone out there uh, in that condition. We probably would have flown from our uh, bag that to the um, only because we didn't have the proper um, vehicles to the convoy. But we did it and um, set up the operation. Didn't know how we was going to, uh, uh, how it was going to stand up the operation. But we got a hangar, um, we were assigned a hangar, pretty much a hangar, we were playing uh, their, their stand.
foundation there that they need to fix, need to be fixed. So we, we took the go hanger, cleaned it up, painted it, um, built offices, hired some of our random people to come in and, and build this offices and clean up the place. And you know, by the way, it, the Iraqi um, folks was very nice and loved Americans and loved soldiers, at least that's what they said. And so we, we, uh, we felt comfortable with them. However, the whole time they were was with us, we had to have our weapons on um, with us, and um, they had to be guarded 24-7 the whole time they were with us. But nevertheless, we did get to know them, and they became pretty good friends of ours. And um, we paid them daily, $10 a day, for them to, uh, to help us to work for us. Um, after the operation was all stood up, you know, that's when you know you get there, you get busy, you get everything done, and then once you get once you're operational, when the time starts to come by, that's when the homesick kicks in, you know, that's when you start coming. Missing your kids and missing your family, and you say, okay, it's been, you know, seven months and you know, you're ready to go home. But, then you do what you have to do. Um, so, but they do let you come home on R&R. And &R. And when I came home on R&R &R in September, uh, got to see, uh, get my kids, we go my kids to school, and, and they were just going to first grade, and I got to meet their teachers. And when I, uh, when I had to go back, it's probably the hardest, that was probably harder than the first time when I left, because, you know, it was, it was all downtime because we were all looking to come home. Um, well, one of the things that um, I'm proud of um, from being in Iraq is that I worked very hard. I gave it my best. And um, I established an operation you know, from scratch. Um, I led soldiers that would follow me anywhere in the world today, I can, I can uh, attest to that. And um, I supervised over 50 KBR civilians, that's Kellogg Brown and Bruce, you know, the same caliber, and uh, civilian uh, mail handlers and truck drivers, and very proud of what um, I accomplished out there. Um, when I got back, I was awarded the Bronze Star, very proud of Coming from, like I said, my background uh, of um, being a mother of 17, being able to stand up here today, I'm very proud of myself. Um, it took a long time for me to be proud of myself and my accomplishment. I do owe it to the military for um, allowing me to have a lot of opportunities. Um, I have my bachelor's the military paid for it. I have my master's, the military paid for it. And like, you know, I think I owe a lot of my life and the way it turned out to the military because they allow you to grow and to, you know, be who you, whoever you want to be. And they bring out the best in you. They brought out the best in me, and uh, I surprised myself every day because I'm still growing, I'm still learning, and um, it's just been a great life. Uh, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything. Um, if I had to do it again, I would. Only I would have uh, liked to have deployed before my days came because. Um, is very hard Hopefully it will have to go again, but I still have seven more years before I can retire. And, um, so every day I think about them calling me saying, oh, you gotta go back, you gotta go back. Um, I am gonna stick it through, I am gonna um, take my seven years and hope and pray that I don't have to leave my days again. But, you know, if I do, then Oh, 
thank you all for listening to me. And um, again, it's been an honor to be here, being up here, being able to talk to you and tell my story. Thank you very much.
for the New York Guard. And just to give you what the New York to give you a heads up what the New York Guard is about, it's the all volunteer military. We are not paid. Uh, um, there's no compensation whatsoever. You know, we do this totally voluntarily, and uh, it's still an opportunity to do something. So it's, uh, I've been in the New York for three years, and it's been a really rewarding experience because we're working side by side with the New York Army National Guard, and uh, it's been a really great learning experience uh, for me. Uh, it started out down in uh, New York City with the 88th Brigade uh, assigned to the Armory uh, on Park Avenue down there. I was part of the 1102nd Medical Forward Support Team. And basically, we were a group of medical people that would work side by side with the National Guard. And, uh, and we, in fact, did do that. Uh, we uh, assisted in uh, doing physicals for troops deploying to, to Iraq. Uh, and we, we worked side by side. Uh, I'm now at uh, Camp Smith and Peak still as part of the 12th Training Regiment. I'm involved with training, uh, um, medical training NCO there, and uh, I'm also now part of the New York um, Surf Team, which means we're involved directly in working with Army and Air National Guard. Uh, uh, basically, we do drills um, to have to respond with any nuclear, biological, or chemical incident. We're working side by side with them. And, even doing a lot of the work because there are so many uh, uh, National Guard troops deployed. So uh, it's been a real great experience for me. And it's given me an opportunity to still serve, even in a volunteer capacity. And uh, it's been a great learning experience for me. And uh, so I guess, uh, you know, serving in the military wasn't totally over for me. But, uh, you know, I'm just having a great time doing what I'm doing now. For any young folks out there, I definitely encourage um, you to, to join the military. It's a, you know, it's a good way to, to learn things, and the camaraderie is great. And I would strongly um, urge anybody that's interested uh, to do so. Thank you for the opportunity to speak.
Okay. Ordinarily, we perform down in front just without anything in front of us, but it might be best today to not turn our backs on all of you. So. We all had our noses pressed to the windows, 
looking out and down. I saw some puffs of smoke and then the plane suddenly went straight, diving up in the air and somebody said we were being fired on. For the first time, it occurred to me that my life might be in peril. Pete. He was a fighter pilot first. A husband, second. A father, third. We loved each other dearly, but I knew he was never really willing. He belonged to the sky, and now the sky has claimed him. Once we arrived in Vietnam, the assigning officer, the nurse assigning officer, assigned me to the 91st evacuation unit in Chu Lai, intensive care and recovery. You remember, I worked in a newborn nursery. This was like going directly into the fire, skipping the frying pan. After I'd been there for a few months, Long enough to get benumbed and put some walls up around me. One day there was an 18-year-old GI who came out of surgery. He'd been in an armored personnel carrier, and he was the only survivor. I knew he was 18, but he looked younger. He hardly even had hair on his face. As he began to wake in recovery, he was calling for his mother. Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. I was barely older than he was. I didn't know what to do. I just held him. But I wanted to call my Mommy. I wanted to call out to her. I wanted to call her up on the telephone. I wanted to ask her if there were any whole 18-year-olds left in the world where she was. Because, of course, in the hospital, the only ones I saw were missing parts of their bodies. And they'd come in, and we'd take care of them for a while, and then they'd go away somewhere else, and we never knew what happened to them. We were there with men in beds, missing arms, legs, faces. Vigil Memories, 1968. I'm standing on the Peace Vigil line in front of the Flusher, Flushing Quaker Meeting House in Queens with the members of my group, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We've been standing here every Saturday for two years to protest the war in Vietnam. We intend to keep standing in here until the war's over. At first, people just stared at us. Vietnam? Where is that? But lately we've been getting some angry responses. Last month a man took the leaflet I handed him and crumpled it in front of my face and threw it on the pavement. Neither of us said a word. Last week a man spat down at my feet. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is the oldest peace group in this country, founded right after World War I, and at the age of 24, I'm my chapter's youngest member. I'm standing here with the oldest people I've ever known. To my left is Virginia. She's in her 90s. When she was young, she chained herself to a lamppost in Manhattan, trying to get women the right to vote. Just beyond her is Erna Baird. Erna is a German Jew survivor of the Holocaust. She and her husband hid from the Nazis for four years in Holland before coming to this country. On this day, she leans out from the vigil line and she calls me, you know what's happening in this country, what our government is doing over in Vietnam. The way people are talking and acting reminds me a lot of Germany just before Hitler came to power. Erna's words disturbed me. 
On my right is Sophie Cohen. Her son is a medic in Vietnam. Her son is helping to fight the war that she's standing here protesting. She's holding a big sign. It says, end the war now. Bring our boys home. But she's got to leave early, so she hands the sign to me. And while I'm holding it, a woman walks by and stops and reads it. And then she takes the leaflet I had her and she reads that and she throws it on the pavement and then she screams, My son is over there! How can you be doing this? I wish Sophie were still here holding this big sign. How do I answer this woman? I hear her anger and her pain. I know I have to keep doing this. I knew I had to move from intensive care and recovery. We all had to do different rotations in the hospital, and so I asked to go next to the Vietnamese prisoner ward. Now, they weren't all prisoners. This is where I learned that war doesn't just kill the soldiers. I remember a lot. A little nine-month-old baby, both of his legs and one of his arms, and his whole belly bandaged. He'd just been in the wrong place. There were so many little children there who looked older at four than I looked at 18. Now, where I come from, where there was plenty of security and plenty to eat, I simply didn't understand what the lives of these people were like. But mostly what was in that ward were Vietnamese prisoners of war. They'd been wounded, hurting and killing our soldiers. And we had to take care of them. One day, there was this North Vietnamese soldier who was rolled into the ward. He had a lot of gunshot wounds. And we knew that he had been responsible personally responsible for the death of six GIs. As he came closer and closer to me, something just snapped. And I knew that I couldn't go any closer to him. Because if I did, I wouldn't be able to keep my hands from around his neck. As a nurse, I had been trained to heal and care and save the lives of anyone I was to help. I had taken an oath to do that. But it was as a nurse that I learned about the feelings that I too could have of violently hating and wanting to kill someone. My third rotation was the worst of all. I was surprised by that. It was the GI Medical Ward, and it was on this ward where all the men who couldn't go out into the field, what we called the cop-outs, the alcoholics, the drug ODs, the guys who stopped taking their malaria pills so they wouldn't have to go out again. This was the hardest for me. I looked at them, I said, I'm a woman and I'm managing. I see nothing but broken men day after day. I can do this. Why can't you? Vietnamese long-haired soldier. In 1975, I had fought the Americans for half my life. By the time of the reunification, I had lived side by side with male comrades for 15 years. We traveled together ate together, studied together, prayed together, fought together, bled together. They called the men fighters, and that's mostly what they did, and they fought bravely and well. They called us women, long-haired soldiers. But in addition to battling the enemy, we had many other duties also. We carried food, ammunition, and weapons. We built roads and bridges and hospitals. We raised crops, 
sewed clothes and cooked meals. We danced and sang and recited poetry. We gave birth and tended the wounded. We taught the children and buried the dead. Many of us women expected that so many years of mutual struggle alongside the men would result in more gender equality after the war. But we were wrong. I had my closest call on the GI medical ward. There was a mortar attack, and they were falling all around us. And I had just gotten my 60 patients out of their beds, under their beds, and their mattresses over them to protect them, and gotten under a bed myself. When this GI next to me said, hey, what about whatever his name was? I looked over, and here's this one guy, one of our drug ODs. He's still on top of his bed, and he's lying there singing. I climbed out from under my bed and I was cursing him as I went to take him from his bed and put him underneath and protect him with a mattress. This was what was happening to me. That happened at the same day, actually the same moment that my sister was getting married back home in the States. I thought, I'm here. And they're partying. Well, there were a lot more things that happened in that year, but what I really want to tell you about is what took me 12 years to get through when I got home. When I was leaving Vietnam, I don't think I breathed till we were a thousand miles away in that plane. I was so afraid that something would happen and we'd have to turn around and go back. When I got to Seattle, I called my family to let them know I was here, and they said, oh, we'll come out to meet you, stay there. We'll sightsee in Seattle for the weekend. They were in Michigan. I sat on that tour bus all that weekend. My body was there, but my head was still back in Vietnam. I looked out the windows and I saw people that didn't even have scared looks on their faces. I just thought, if they only knew. Well, about six months after I got home from Vietnam, I married. I met Rick on my last R&R &R in Japan, and I worked for four years in the local hospital in Utah, where we lived, while he went to college. I didn't know any other women veterans then. Oh, I really wanted to meet some, but I wasn't broadcasting that I was a veteran from Vietnam. During that time, you didn't do that. But I was really hoping I would meet someone. And there were things that were happening to me. I had a wonderful husband, a wonderful job, and then a beautiful baby. But I would consider suicide. I had such nightmares, but as soon as I woke up from them, I would try to forget them so I didn't even know what they were about. It wasn't until six years after that, when we were living in Chicago and I was working in an emergency room, one night, there was a woman who brought her son in. He'd been hurt in a street fight. He had a big two-inch gash over his eye, and his eye was swollen shut. She had to beg and plead to get him to come to this hospital. He was an African-American boy. And he was 15, and it was that time. And although I was kind to him, and I begged, and I cajoled, there was no way that he was going to let a white woman nurse touch him. His mother finally gave up and let him go home. I watched them long out, his eye all swollen, the gash wide. And I remembered the hostility that I had felt that night when I was on the Vietnamese PMW ward. I had one of my worst nightmare bouts after that. 
I had to stop nursing. Three years later, 12 years after I'd gone home from Vietnam, well actually nine years, I was reading about this murder case in Oregon. It was a Vietnam vet who got her stuck. And I was reading about his defense and his lawyer was talking about all these things that he felt and did. And as I was reading this article, I said, this is me. This is me when I'm yelling at Rick or the kids or the dog. They called it delayed stress syndrome. And I spent years and months reading up on it. I knew a lot about it, but I still had it. Because it took me a long time to think about going to a group, and then a long time to find a group of women that I could join. When I first joined the group, I thought I wouldn't say a word. I'd just sit there and listen. But inside my head, I kept saying, that's me. That's it. The thing that pushed me from silence into speech was watching the film Friendly Fire on television. The young GI in there was so like so many of the men I treated, blown on innocent, and then scared and confused, and then hard-nosed and cynical, his heart getting hard as mine had. I was taking notes as I watched because I had my group the next day and I didn't even realize it, but when he got killed at the end, my pen was tearing into the paper. I was saying, I can't stand this. Every one of those men that I lost, that I saw go, they took a piece of me when they went with them and I want it all back. The next day in the group, I read from my notebook. I couldn't have spoken it without it. But even so, when I was done speaking, my palms were bleeding because my fingernails had dug into them so much. A week or so after that, we met with the man in the group. It was so wonderful to see healthy, whole men getting healthier. And there was this one guy, Dan, big, gentle, huge guy. And he started talking about how he'd gotten so afraid going out into the field that he asked one of his friends to try and break his collarbone with his rifle so that he wouldn't have to go anymore. And I thought, oh no, you have to be one of those. But as he talked and explained that his friend had hit him as hard as he could, but couldn't break anything. He was so big. He said he probably saved my life because I wouldn't have been able to live with myself. That's how I got home. And after that, I realized that we all just coped as best we could. Now, my nightmares are gone. My depression mostly. And I have two big goals, and one of them is to help prevent anything like that from happening again. And the other is, if I can help just one other woman not to go through what I went through after I came home, it would all be worth it. I got into recreation work in high school as a camp counselor. And in college, I was doing recreation with delinquent teens in a state reformatory. And my professor says to me, well, you want to join Army Special Services. So I signed up for Germany. I got sent to Vietnam. Me and this one other woman flew over in a plane filled with soldiers. For 36 hours, we were just stared at by all these guys. That's what I'm getting used to. We arrived over Saigon at twilight, and I looked down and saw these little cook fires burning. And when we got off the plane, we were just hit by this heat, like we're in an oven. 
And then they all get loaded onto this cage truck. Well, that was pretty disconcerting. And on the way to the hospital, the truck, uh, to the hotel, excuse me, the truck had to divert around a Buddhist monk who had set himself on fire. He was just sitting there in the middle of the street, cross-legged burning to protest the war. Well, for me, that was just unbelievable. Finally, get to the hotel, and there's an American soldier at the door guarding it with a gun, and suddenly, it hits me. This is not going to be like watching the war on TV. I, I could get killed here. Well, my first assignment was a rec center with the 1st Infantry Division, not too far from Saigon. And I remember guys coming in to us straight from the field. They'd be dirty, filthy, stinking like you wouldn't believe, but they wanted to come in and sit down and have a cup of coffee. And I remember their hands shaking and the haunted look in their eyes. And then they started telling me their stories. And I began to realize what these guys were going through. And more and more the war seemed real. And then suddenly it's tech and all hell's breaking loose. For 10 days we're under siege. There's people cracking all around me. I mean, we're holed up in bunkers. We're having sapper attacks. There's shooting at snipers, and the post commander, he keeps saying, oh, I'm not worried about being overrun. I'll just trade my females here for safety. Joe, huh? Not funny. I was terrified. I think what got me through those 10 days and the rest of my time in Vietnam was I was so busy being a caretaker, I was unaware of my own needs. See, I was there to make things better for the guys, to be mother, sister, girl next door to take their minds off the war and to listen to their problems. The other time I was in a helicopter that was getting fired on and it tilted to one side and then sort of skimmed the treetops to get out of range and I was terrified, absolutely. And when it was all over, I was so angry because we women were non-combatants. Except we were in these situations where we could have been killed just as easily as the men, only we couldn't shoot back. We never had the chance. So what do you do with all this anger and all this fear? You absorb it. Because you've got a job to do. And that job involves taking care of people. I got this letter from my great aunt around that time. She's in her 80s, but we were very close. She had a pet parakeet that was her only companion because she'd outlived all her friends. And in the letter, she's telling me that the parakeet died and how sad she was. And it made me cry. Now, I knew it was silly because I'm sitting there at my desk crying about a dead parakeet when I should be out there calling bingo for the guys. And this woman I work with comes in and she stares at me and she says, I don't care what you just read in that letter. You get out there and you call bingo. These guys deserve a respite from the war. That's your mission. So you get out there and call bingo now. She just sort of lifted me up like a scruff of my neck. So I stopped crying. And I went out and I called bingo. And then there was a time I was in the hospital with some kind of intestinal flu, but I wasn't staying in bed. I was going around to all the wards, visiting all the soldiers in their beds, handing out gum and candy and cigarettes. And I got to this area where there were guys being brought in from a helicopter crash. And there was one guy, I'll never forget him. You couldn't tell if he was a black guy or a white guy. He was just this lump with a tube at one end and some uh, sort of raspy breathing. I just stared at him thinking, how can any of this be worth it? This was once a human being. It was so bizarre and surrealistic, like a dream. Of course, my work, making happiness in the middle of a war, was kind of surrealistic, too. Like the time I climbed all the guard towers on our post, wearing a Santa Claus outfit. It was Christmas Eve, and I was worried about the guys who pulled guard duty and how lonely they'd be while the rest of us partied. So I you know, put all these gum and candy and cigarettes in little bags and I put on a Santa Claus suit and got a friend to drive me around in the Jeep and I climbed every tower on the post that night. Next morning, the post commander reads me the riot act. Do you realize 
what a prime target you made last night, climbing those towers with all that white fur on. That was the stupidest thing you ever did. But see, I felt like those guys needed me. They needed me to make things better for them. Folk song nurse. I was always very small, even for a woman. I became a nurse to help our wounded fighters return to the north. They never complained when the rations were short or when we ran out of morphine for their pain. I would walk alongside the trucks or the litters they were being cared on, singing folk songs. The stern cadres reprimanded me. Maintain noise discipline. Maintain security. But the songs were good medicine. And sometimes my wounded comrades, when they could, would sing along with me. It was better than listening for the bombs. Well, I stayed two extra months in Vietnam because I couldn't find anyone to replace me. And when I got home, it felt like I had aged 20 years in 14 months, like the fast forward on a tape. I didn't fit in. I didn't know what to do with myself for a long time. There was much to hate in Vietnam. You always felt exposed, vulnerable. Of course, you're in the middle of the plain horror of it. And I've often thought if I had a daughter, I wouldn't want her to go through what I went through. I'd want her to be challenged by life, sure. But I wouldn't want her to be destroyed. Vietnam had the capacity to destroy. But there was much I loved there, too. When it came to bargaining and getting things done, I was one of the best. Let's say you needed plywood or paint to fix up your rec center. Well, you'd have to call around and find some place they had what you needed, and then you'd have to get someone to fly over there, and then you'd have to figure out what you had to trade to get what you wanted. All that gave me a great sense of power. And I always felt justified using that power because I was using it to help other people. And when I got home from Vietnam, I missed the respect I got over there. You worked hard. The guys there all respected you. But still, <coughs> it was hard for me for a long time when I got back. Finally went back to school, and now I counsel Vietnam veterans. And it, it's working with the guys that have helped me learn how to live with my own experiences. I can't say I survived without some emotional damage, but I, I feel like I came back stronger despite the scars. Scarred, but stronger. I'll never forget any of it. But now I can put my memories in perspective and get on with my life.